Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our worship service this evening. My name is Pastor Randy Showman, and I serve two little congregations in Adams County, St. John's and United in Christ. And I bring you greetings from those congregations tonight. Uh, for our worship today, we're going to be following the order of service found on page 229 of your Lutheran service book. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there is one change in the bulletin. Uh, as you listed in the bulletin here, under the hymn of the day, um, it's listed, Oh, dearest Jesus, what law hast thou broken? It says 414 underneath there, but it's not. It's like it's listed up there. When we get to that point, it's hymn number 439. And I'll announce that at that time. Right now, I'd ask you to join me in beginning today as we sing our opening hymn, which will be hymn number 440, Jesus I Will Ponder Now. Please rise. We continue now with the words <clears throat> of the response of speaking. O Lord, open my lips.
Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. The office hymn for this evening is hymn number 439. Please join me now in singing, O Dearest Jesus. You may be seated as we sing. The Old Testament reading for tonight is recorded in the prophet Joel's words in the second chapter, beginning at the twelfth verse. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts, and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, 
weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil. You will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your excuse me, the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, and early and the later rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dwelt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never be put to shame. And, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. The epistle lesson is much briefer than the Old Testament lesson. It's recorded for us in the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. We begin our reading at verse five, chapter 5 and verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of of Christ be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the, the favorable time Behold, now is the day of salvation. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. As is our custom, we rise now for the reading of the Holy Gospel, which speaks the words of the life of Christ. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have your reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. 
But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. O Lord, have mercy on us. Please join me now in the responsory. Deliver me, O God, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord, my God. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. be seated to hear the word of God. The portion of God's word for our meditation today is the Gospel of Luke in chapter 22, where we begin with verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. Now we continue at verse 24 and following. Also, a dispute rose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, Kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, Strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you out with when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, But now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. This is the word of our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts prove both acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Jesus, who have taken the time out of your busy day or week to pause for a while. And why? Because we know how sinful we are. We need the reminder that God has overlooked our sin. No, really, he has paid for our sin in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, think with me for a second about these words and what they could mean, if you will. I didn't mean to do that. If you say it a certain way, I didn't mean to do that, or I didn't mean to do that, you're saying that your choices have made something happen. 
but you had no intention of causing that to happen, right? But if you say, I don't mean, I didn't mean to do that, well, then there's kind of a little wiggle room in your conversation there in that statement. We know that something bad has happened, right? And you didn't mean to do that, but you realize that you could have stopped it from happening, or maybe worse, you should have known better, right? That you didn't mean to do that. Have you ever watched a certain type of an accident, the car wreck, happen, right? It happens, right? In fact, some of those accidents are, they come like lightning quick, right? And then there's the other type. Another type of wreck, like one that I saw long ago, was one that was hard to watch. The driver didn't mean to do it, of course, but he really should have known better. There was, after all, as you looked at the situation there, a red light up ahead. That was clue number one for him, like for any good driver here in the state of Wisconsin. And then there was also the cars that were stopped at the red light, and of course their brake lights were shining brightly. That was clue number two. And of course, there was a speed limit, as is often the case, right? Very helpful hint there, too. But I was driving behind these people in this situation when I just saw a car that I noticed was just keeping on plowing forward and not slowing down at all. And there came a moment when I remembered that, oh no, I realized that I'm going to see something that I don't really want to see happen, and there's not much I can do about it. You know, it feels like it's kind of in slow motion with this type of thing happens. I saw it. It was coming right in front of me, and so I was not able to be involved in it or to stop it. And thankfully, after it was all over, there were no serious injuries. Nobody needed to be taken to the hospital. But the driver, who was not paying attention, and who hit the brakes too late, and who fishtailed sideways and smacked right into the back end of the vehicle in front of her, that driver should have known better, of course, right? I can almost imagine her saying to the police officer and, then officer and then also to the insurance company, I didn't mean to do that. But she did. <laughs> well, the reading that I've just read from you, for you from the Gospel of Luke in the 22nd chapter tonight kind of reminds me of watching a wreck like this happen, right? The apostles you see in this picture in our mind's eye, which is a true story, right? where Jesus' hand-picked inner circle. And they were with him there in that upper room before the time of his crucifixion, right? And the reading, as we hear it, gives us a sort of a back and forth, forth and back between Jesus and the apostles, his disciples. But it's really kind of painful to watch with our mind's eye, right? And in a way, it's kind of frightening, too. It kind of strikes close to home when you think about it. The evil is at work in the events that are going to take place. These disciples are actually involved in folly, or you might call it, they're being quite arrogant, right? But they should have known better, just like we know that too, from our religious training, right? From our time in Christ, it's the time most of us were probably knee high to a grasshopper, right? Well, let's spend a little time for a moment, if you would, with me in these verses and watch the spiritual wreck unfolds before us in this story, right? There were those verses, I'm going to reread some of them from verse 24 to 27 that go like this. Also a dispute uh, uh, arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, the one who rules, like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you, the one who serves. If I can be a little bold here this evening, I think that the disciples might be described here as being a little foolish or stupid, right? We don't often like to use that word, right? Maybe a, a nicer word to be using would be, they were filled with folly in their actions, right? And they're caught up in utter folly. Because up there in that upper room, after Jesus had instructed them and then instituted before them the Lord's Supper for the very first time and predicted for them his betrayal, 
They get into an argument among themselves. Just like little children, you could say, right? But which one of them is the greatest? Remember the ones you used to have when you were little? My dad's bigger than your dad. My dad, you know. How silly. How futile. It's hard to reconstruct it, so we don't even want to try, but Luke wants us to think about this at, li at least a little bit, and, and notice the evil that is attached to this folly of these disciples. What they're doing is really evil, right? You could ask the question, do they mean to do that? Well, do they mean to do evil? In one sense, probably they didn't, right? But in another real sense, they certainly did, right? They should have known better, and yet they kept on doing what they were doing. They were arguing out of all things about who is the greatest. Well, in the upper room there with one who, well, actually, as we know, is the greatest, right? We bow on our knees and worship and bring the Lenten season. Then we also do so on Easter morning, probably with lilies and trumpets and all kinds of beautiful songs, because he is the greatest who came to do what we can never do. And of course, Jesus has taught them, and he showed them what true greatness is really about. And that's why I'm here today, tonight, to remind you of those things. As I remind myself as I go through this message or sermon myself in preparation for speaking it to you. Jesus has to teach them again, and he tells them that they are really thinking uh, or acting like pagans, like unbelievers, like the Gentiles do like worldly power brokers and big shots. That's the evil way of thinking about greatness, and that's the way of our world that we live in, isn't it? And in verse 26, the translation offers the words, but not so with you. That's what Jesus says to us as little children who are grown up, right? Some of us older with wrinkles and glasses, right? Well, in this unexpected reign of God that Jesus has been bringing into the world, and of which, of course, he is the very central part of all of it, uh, status and importance are turned upside down. Or you might even say really right side up, the way it ought to be. Jesus is right there, receiving there with them at the table what is important. He tells them that he will take the place of the one who serves at the table. When's the last time you went out to eat them, right? If you went to a fancy restaurant, right, they probably had white linens on the tables, and somebody came, maybe if you had a little wine, they had a, a little bit of a white kind of a napkin over their arm, and they poured that wine for you, right? It wouldn't be appropriate for you to take the bottle and pour it. But, you know, when we think of a servant, that's what they're trained to do, to do it to the best of their ability. And this is the task that Jesus was really taking upon himself. They, these disciples, of course, as I've said numerous times already, should have known better. But still, up there in the upper room, we keep watching that wreck as it unfolds right before our eyes, and it's, it's kind of hard to watch. And there's better things that we might think that we would like to be doing at this moment. But Jesus first comforts, and then he warns his disciples in this setting. He warns si uh, Simon Peter, and then he warns all the others that are gathered there too. But they reject his warning, right? They shrug off the master's words. And the only thing we can call it is pure arrogance, pride, or boastfulness. Let's take a look at that for a minute. If there's anything that you hate in another person, isn't it when they act arrogant, as if they're better than others? Well, this is indeed what they're involved with. But Jesus begins in his teaching of them at this point with the point of comfort, right? And by the way, that's the gospel, the good news in, in that narrow sense, right? And that's why you're here tonight. If I was going to tell you just, okay, go out and keep the Ten Commandments, and you'll be godly. That wouldn't leave you with much comfort in times of trial and temptation. Right? Well, my friends, Jesus makes a remarkable promise here for their future, right? He promises them a share in his kingdom. Now, that's not any small deal, is it, right? In his reign. In fact, on the last day, he says, these holy disciples will, in some mysterious way for us to understand, actually participate in the judgment. Now, without taking anything away from Jesus' unique identity 
as the judge of the living and the dead. The 12 will sit, he says, on thrones as they judge the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what Jesus says. How that will play out, I, I don't really envision. I don't know. You get a glimpse here of this remarkable future promise, though, to these disciples, also in Revelation chapter 21. And there is recorded the vision of the new Jerusalem in the last day, when that new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, and this earth is renewed, that city will have, well, foundation stones to match the 12 gates, right, of the temple. And on the foundation stones, believe it or not, are written the names of the 12 apostles. <laughs> Mystery is here to be sure, and I can't explain everything that Jesus intends to say, but that's quite a promise, right? Jesus promises us glory instead of what we really deserve. And this is what fills our hearts, right? Even as we sing these hymns that speak about the joy we have in our hearts because God didn't overlook sin, but he faced it head on in Jesus, our Savior. But why does Jesus make this promise here, right now on that particular night in that upper room? Well, it's like when we need to hear it. He gives us strength, and he helps us to uh, understand what is coming in front of us, what will come next in our lives, how we can deal with it. And so after he promises them, then he warns them about what is coming, right? To Simon Peter, Jesus speaks very directly, right? Satan is present. See, Satan is active, alive. He's powerful, and he's after not only Simon Peter, that brash and bold disciple, but after all of the disciples, the apostles there. And Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you. And if you look at the Greek word for you there, it's actually the plural use of the word, which means all of you. To sift you like wheat. And it's going to be the hardest thing that you'll ever know in your life. But Jesus' prayer for Simon will mean that after that particularly difficult time of trouble, that Simon will turn back in faith to his Lord. He will return to faith, and then he must strengthen the others. And this is something you need to take part in. We have all dealt with failures and sin in our lives, right? Our own sins. We have fallen away from the Lord, but you know, he raises us up, dusts us off, and gives us strength to carry on. And that's what he's telling here. And when you do carry on, then be an example of God's grace to other people. And see, that's what keeps us humble. Right? So why does Jesus make this promise here right now on this night in that upper room? Well, it's to strengthen him, as I said. And when he spoke those words, he wanted him to know exactly what would happen in his life. See, life isn't really all about sweetness and light, right? Sometimes life is, as some people say, not a bowl of cherries, but simply the pits. That's because that's the truth, right? There are going to be difficult times. Imagine the Lutheran Christians, there are many of them, in Ukraine right now, right? Under assault, in a war in their own country. Imagine if that happened to us. And we had to deal with what was coming. See, this is why God prepares us on occasions like this for our daily lives. But as you know, as you hear these words, what we have to note also is that Peter rejects that warning, right? I'm ready, he says. I'm ready to go to prison and even die with you. What? Jesus just told him that he was going to be blasted and twisted by Satan, right? But that time will come when you'll turn again in faith to Jesus. But Peter says, nope, that will never happen. I'm ready. He says it right to Jesus' face, as if he has all the strength and none of the worry. You suppose Simon Peter meant to do the evil? Yes, he did. Because he should have known better, just like we know better. When we sin, we darn well know, right? The law planted in our heart tells us that is wrong in God's eyes. In our Bible, in our small catechism, also reveal that same truth, right? <clears throat> yes, because you should have known better, he says. You should have listened to Jesus right there in front of you, and, and Simon keeps on not listening. Even when Jesus says, you will deny me three times, 
before that rooster is going to croak. Peter isn't listening. He's going in one ear and out the other. He's too proud. And he's also that night going to find out what Jesus means is true, right? The rooster will crow, and then he will remember, and his pride will be gone. And then he weeps bitterly. Have you ever wept bitterly over a stupid decision that you made? Sin? Well, I have. And Peter did too. My friends, is the Lord of gentleness telling these people in this situation here uh, that they should arm themselves? He asked them the question, when I sent you out, did, uh, did you lack anything? And they answered, we lack nothing, Lord. And that's when he says to them uh, that they are going to be needing a sword. <laughs> you know, some people are kind of queasy about carrying arms of any type, right? Even if they're to defend yourself or your family. But in this situation, is the Lord of gentleness telling them to arm themselves? No, he really isn't, right? Luke alone, his gospel, is the only one of the four synoptic gospels that tells us that Jesus not only stops the sword swinging in Gethsemane, right? But after Peter is foolish enough to cut off the ear of Malchus, Jesus repairs that ear better than any surgeon, right? Plastic surgeon in America today could be. You know, he's not telling them to arm themselves, but that's how they take it because they, like Peter, are listening. They don't realize that Jesus is actually warning them and trying to prepare them for how hard it's going to be to face the things that are coming. But just as Peter thought that he was ready, the rest of them felt that way too. And they said, look, we've got two swords already, Lord. And you can just hear the words of Jesus What's going on in his heart and mind is kind of sad, and a weary voice says, it is enough. In other words, you're not listening. Evil is coming, and they should have known better, and the evil was right there in the room with them and with Jesus. You see, that wasn't an accident. It isn't because, you know, at that point in his life, Jesus had a lack of power. <laughs> Remember, when Jesus humbled himself, he set aside his power and glory for a time only using it as he saw fit, like for the miracles that he performed. And yet, as we look into the situation, God isn't letting that time in that upper room be wasted. No, it's just not time for anything else. There's going to be misunderstanding and folly and arrogance. And, and as we watch that wreck unfolding before us, right, we see God's plan unfolding there. And we see God using evil to move his plan forward. Have you ever lost confidence in somebody that you thought should have been stronger? Maybe that was a parent. Maybe that was a brother or sister. Maybe it was you. And this is the same kind of place we find ourselves in, right? We see God using evil right in his very plan to do good, to move it forward. The disciples don't mean to do that, but they certainly should have known better. But God knew better still. And the truth is, like you're going to hear from every week, from every pastor that comes here, what God meant it for you. So all that rotten stuff that's happened in your life, God meant it for good. He's going to use that too to change you into his type of individual, a child on the way to heaven. You know, the disciples, folly is like a sign. It's kind of like a huge arrow pointing away from themselves and pointing at Jesus, right? In other words, here is your hope. Here is your strength. Here is your Lord and Savior. In the good times and in the bad, you will need you. Well, while they bicker and fight, only one among them understands. And that, of course, is our Savior himself. He is among them, Jesus said. He is among them as the one, the only one, who serves. You know, in our synod, the Lutheran Church in Missouri Synod, we're going through a period of time trying to do what we can to get young people to serve in the ministry as teachers or BCEs or as pastors or missionaries, right? Do you know anyone that can fit that bill? That's what we ask, right? Well, God is looking at your heart. How can you serve him and serve other people? It doesn't have to be in full-time ministry, right? But from this story, we learn from Jesus what it means to serve. 
It means that, yeah, I could make a lot more money doing this or have a lot more fame and fortune doing that. But I'm going to do this because I really do care about those people that I'm serving. And I know my Lord keeps on caring about me. You know, the disciples' arrogance is kind of like a piece of a puddle, puzzle. But it's not the centerpiece of the puzzle, thank you, the good Lord. Their evil is a part of it, and if it's right into that plan, right into the pattern taking shape of Jesus moves forward toward the fulfillment of what he came here on earth to do, that pattern will bring great, wise, serving, innocent Son of Man, or Son of God, into the very midst of sinners, of transgressors. That's what Isaiah's prophecy said about 700 years before Jesus actually walked on this earth, right, physically. It says he was numbered with the transgressors. And as Jesus said, it must be fulfilled. But that's not stuff that people like us like to hear. Peter didn't like to hear that, right? And the Lord ended up telling him, get behind me, Satan. He knew he was talking to Peter, but he's acting like Satan, isn't he? When Isaiah is fulfilled, it'll be like a rock that's dropped in the pool of water. And you know what happens then, right? You see those concentric circles that emanate from it, larger and larger and larger, right? He was numbered with the transgressors, yes. And there will be one evildoer on his right and on his left. And you know where that took place, right? On that hill outside of Jerusalem called Golgotha, the place of the skull, where Jesus was treated as the worst of sinners because he took on Randy Shulman's sins and yours too and every one of those apostles, so that he might pay for them. You know, Jesus has not come to save himself, and in God's way to be the greatest. He was numbered with the transgressors, and you know what happens? That circle widens as we think of who he really did this for. The circle widens to the other apostles in that room besides Peter. It means that it's also enveloping all of these people that I see seated in front of me and one behind me, Day during this service tonight in this room. The truth is, Jesus overcomes the evil in lives like ours, right? He renews us and sets us back on the path of righteousness. He overcomes it in the midst of it by dying for it. He actually lets the evil win, and he does it so that it can do its worst against God and man. But when it's done, it's done. It's finished, right? What did Jesus say on the cross? In his final words, just about his final words, he said, when he breathed his last, he said, it is finished. See, you can't keep those commandments. God wants you to strive to do it out of love for him, who gave his last ounce of energy so that we might be saved. So, my friends, when you're in the middle of a wreck, uh, as it's happening, it's kind of hard to see things coming, but sometimes God helps us to see it. And he helps us to see our own foolishness and stupidity. Sometimes when we think we're better than other people, other people that may be younger than us, or perhaps older than us, or maybe of a different skin color or, or sex than us, our thinking that we can even walk down the street without the mercy and strength of God alone, right? makes us think of selfish things. It's hard to see it coming, but sometimes when we feel that way, God makes things happen, and when they do, we praise Him for it. And so I want to invite you this evening to ask God for that kind of honesty and that kind of humility in your life, to ask God's mercy to see the folly coming, to turn away from it and the pride that is in you, and in doing that, Jesus will receive all the Sometimes we go into that evil, don't we? And we judge each other. We live as though we were the masters of our own fate, the lords of our own destiny and our days and our schedules and our wallets and even our relationships. I didn't mean to do that. But you know what? I did it anyway. When that happens, remember, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And pray that God will take my folly and your pride and turn it into a sign like that huge bright arrow that points away from ourselves and anything we can do to of course Jesus himself who was numbered among the transgressors 
is here among us for good. In Jesus, God meant it for good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. I now invite you to join me in the singing of our next hymn, number 436, Go to Dark Gethsemane. This time we'll receive our offerings for the work of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. rises and sing the words of Jesus. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, 
Lord. You know, raise our voices to heaven in that prayer, which the Lord has given us permission to pray.
Thank you.